Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, we filmed this program in Manhattan, and the mood here is somber, to say the least. People on the train are just quietly, silently reading the New York Times, either in print or on their phone, and the mood, well, there's a palpable sense of melancholy in the air. And the reason is obvious. The 2024 election has officially been decided, and Donald Trump will be the 47th president of the United States, becoming the second president in American history to serve two non-consecutive terms. And the victory that Trump scored on election night was sweeping. For instance, Nevada and Arizona are still being counted, but Trump is leading. And unless the remaining ballots really have a big flip, well, Trump will have won every single swing state, including Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and North Carolina. Besides that, he won the popular vote, something no Republican president has done since George W. Bush back in 2004. And on top of that, the Republicans overwhelmingly took back the Senate. And as of right now, we're filming this program on the morning of Thursday, and it looks like the Republicans might retain control of the House as well. If they do, that will give them a trifecta for the next two years. And this victory, it actually becomes more dramatic when you break things down a bit more granularly. For instance, if you look at all the counties in the U.S. and you look at the results this year compared to the results in 2020, you'll find that over 90 percent of all counties, they shifted more towards Trump. Meaning that, for example, if Trump led a county in the year 2020 by six points, this year he might have led that same county by 10 points. Or, for instance, if he lost a county in 2020 by 25 points, this year Trump only lost it by 10 points. That's the kind of shift that took place across the whole country. Furthermore, this shift is incredibly broad. It's not just rural white voters in the countryside. Instead, this shift towards Trump, it happened in the very types of counties that are traditionally thought to be strongholds for Democrats. For instance, in urban counties, Trump saw a 5% shift. In suburban counties, it was a 4% shift. In counties that were majority black, Trump saw a 3% shift. In counties that were majority Native American, there was a 10% shift. In counties that were majority Hispanic, Trump saw a 13% shift. In counties that were less educated, Trump saw a 5% shift. In counties that were more educated, Trump saw a 4% shift. Farming counties were 3%, mining counties were 5%, manufacturing counties were 3%. And the same trend, it also holds true across different age demographics. In counties with large populations of young voters, Trump saw a 5% shift. In counties with a lot of middle-aged voters, he saw a 6% shift. In older counties, Trump saw a 5% shift. I mean, just overall, among nearly every single demographic, basically, no matter how you slice up the electorate, Trump increased his margins substantially this year. Also, several notable counties flipped red, such as Miami-Dade County over in Florida, Passaic, New Jersey, Nassau, New York, Carlton, Minnesota, Webb County, Texas, which has voted Democrat in every single election since 1912, they went for Trump this time, and also Starr County, Texas, which has voted exclusively Democrat since 1892, and Starr County has the highest Hispanic percentage in the whole country. They flipped to Trump this election cycle. All this is a reflection of the type of broad coalition that the Trump campaign was able to stitch together, which chipped away at the traditional strongholds of the Democrat Party. Furthermore, nowhere else is this better reflected than in the popular vote. Because while, yes, of course, Trump won all the red states, what's really wild is the type of inroads that he was able to make within the very blue states. For instance, if we take a look at Illinois, this year, Trump only lost by eight points. Compare that to the years 2020 and 2016, where he lost by 17 points each time. This year, however, it was only eight points. In New Jersey, Trump only lost by five points, while back in 2020, that was 16 points. And New York is perhaps the most illustrating example here. In the year 2020, Trump lost the state of New York by 23 points. However, this year, he only lost by 12 points. That is literally a 50% shift towards red in the bluest of the blue state. Even in California, Trump went from losing in the year 2020 by 29 points to only losing by 17 points this year. Putting all these broad gains together was what allowed Trump to win not only in the Electoral College, but also in the popular vote as well. The tally as of this morning, as of Thursday morning, was that Kamala Harris has about 68 million votes to Trump's 72 million. Now, the big question here is, of course, what exactly happened? 
how could we have gone from Joe Biden in the year 2020 officially receiving 81 million votes to Kamala Harris this year only receiving 67 million? What happened to those 13 million people? Did they sit the election out? Did they change their vote to Trump this year? What exactly is the story? Well, of course, that'll have to be done in a post-election deep analysis. But until then, I'd love to know your thoughts. Please leave them in the comments section below. I'll be reading them through them later tonight, as well as over the week. And while you're down there, consider smashing those like and subscribe buttons as well so that this video can reach ever more people. Regardless, though, getting back to the data, the Senate, which has been under Democrat control since the year 2021, has this year flipped back to the Republicans. Now, we are again filming this episode on Thursday morning, uh, Thursday, November the 7th. And as of right now, the official tally has Republicans flipping three seats for a 52 seat majority. For your reference, those three seats were flipped with pretty decent margins. Ohio was R plus four, Montana was R plus seven, and West Virginia was R plus 41. Also, if you take a peek at Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, those three states are still being counted as of this morning. Well, it looks like the Republicans might be able to pick up at least one of those seats as well, which if that's the case, that would give them a 53 seat majority. However, regardless of whether it's 52 or 53, the fact is that the Republicans were able to capture the presidency as well as the Senate, and this will prove quite consequential. That's because the Senate is where the confirmations happen for things like Trump's cabinet positions, judicial nominations, Supreme Court picks, ambassadorships, and so on. And so with the Senate in Republican control, it's fair to assume that the confirmation process next year will likely be very fast. Then in terms of the House, as of this morning, Republicans have 205 seats compared to Democrats 191. There are still enough races to be counted such that either party could take it, although at the moment it appears that the Republicans are trending towards winning the House as well, but of course you never know. Just for your reference, the majority of the districts where a winner in the House has yet to be called are all in the western part of the country, with about one third of them being exclusively in the state of California. And in California, they have a state law that as long as a mail-in ballot was postmarked on election day, it will be counted as long as it comes in before Tuesday, November the 12th. Meaning that if things are razor thin, we might not know the results in the House until sometime in maybe the middle of next week. Now, late in the evening on election night, Trump took to the stage in Mar-a-Lago and he declared victory. Here was part of what he said in his speech. And just for your reference, I'm gonna speed up his speech just a little bit so that way we can get through it faster. This was a movement like nobody's ever seen before. And frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. There's ever been anything like this in this country and maybe beyond. And now it's going to reach a new level of importance because we're going to help our country heal. We're going to help our country heal. We have a country that needs help, and it needs help very badly. We're going to fix our borders. We're going to fix everything about our country. And we made history for a reason tonight, and the reason is going to be just that. We overcame obstacles that nobody thought possible, and it is now clear that we've achieved the most incredible political thing. Look what happened. Is this crazy? Then subsequently, roughly one day later, Kamala Harris came out and she gave a concession speech. Here's part of what she said. There's an adage an historian once called a law of history, true of every society across the ages. The adage is only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. I know many people feel like we are entering a dark time. But for the benefit of us all, I hope that is not the case. But here's the thing, America, if it is, let us fill the sky with the light of a brilliant, brilliant billion of stars. The light, the light of optimism, of faith, of truth, and service. H-U. <laughs> And may that work guide us, even in the face of setbacks, toward the extraordinary promise of the United States of America. And then lastly, just earlier today at 11 a.m. Eastern, Joe Biden came out and he made some remarks of his own regarding the election, emphasizing the need for a peaceful transition of power.
take a listen. And again, just for your reference, I'm going to speed up his speech just a little bit so that way we can get through it faster. America has carried on the greatest experiment in self-government in the history of the world. And that's not hyperbole. That's a fact. We're the people. The people vote and choose their own leaders, and they do it peacefully. And we're in a democracy. The will of the people always prevails. Yesterday, I spoke with President-elect Trump to congratulate him on his victory. And I assured him that I'd direct my entire administration to work with his team to ensure a peaceful and orderly transition. That's what the American people deserve. Yesterday, I also spoke with Vice President Harris. She's been a partner and a public servant. She ran an inspiring campaign, and everyone got to see something that I learned early on to respect so much, her character. She has a backbone like a ramrod. She has great character, true character. She gave her whole heart and effort, and she and her entire team should be proud of the campaign they ran. You know, the struggle for the soul of America since our very founding has always been an ongoing debate and still vital today. I know for some people, it's a time for victory, to state the obvious. For others, it's a time of loss. Campaigns are contests of competing visions. The country chooses one or the other. We accept the choice the country made. I've said many times, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your neighbor only when you agree. Something I hope we can do, uh, no matter who you voted for, is see each other not as adversaries, but as fellow Americans. Bring down the temperature. I also hope we can lay to rest the question about the integrity of the American electoral system. And so there you have it. Starting on January 20th of next year, Donald J. Trump will be back in the White House for a second term as the 47th president of the United States. And one takeaway from this whole experience that I think is really worth mentioning, at least to me, is the question of whether polls are reliable anymore. Because I myself was following the polls fairly closely this election cycle, and they were showing a neck and neck raise that was well within the margin of error up until the very end. In fact, the polls showed a raise that was so close that we here at Facts Matter, we literally made an episode explaining what would happen if there was a tie in the Electoral College. And even one single day prior to the election, the pollsters, many of them, they were saying that Harris was going to win. For instance, 538, Nate Silver, Sabato's Crystal Ball, The Economist, Elections Daily, Race to the White House, all of them were predicting a Harris victory, which is fine for a normal person on the street to make such a prediction. But when you have these pollsters making such a prediction that then winds up falling so far out of line with the underlying reality, well, it's a little hard to trust them moving forward. Let me know if you agree with that analysis in the comment section. And also, let me know your thoughts about why exactly the polls are so wrong. Do you think that the Trump vote is just a little bit too difficult to track? Because if you people receive a phone call, maybe they're a little bit too reluctant to talk about their support for Trump publicly. Or is it such a broad coalition that people in politics aren't used to tracking such people? Let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to know your thoughts. And also, again, as you're making your way down there to the comment section to leave your thoughts, if you haven't already, take a quick moment to smash those like and subscribe buttons so that this content can reach ever more people via the YouTube algorithm. And then, until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed. Most importantly, stay free.